right. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Amphitheater Hot Shop here at the Corning Museum of Glass. Uh, we have a, a very special opportunity for you today. We have uh, a very special visiting artist with us. This is John Zinner, and he is visiting us from Lausche, Germany. Uh, Lausche, Germany sits in the Thuringian region of eastern Germany, uh, in the middle of the mountains, beautiful area, and a very long history of glass making. Uh, Lausche actually was incorporated back in 1597 by a couple families of glass workers who were looking for a, a new area to set up a new glass shop. And John actually comes from a tradition of several generations of glass makers. Uh, John is a highly skilled flame worker. Uh, he began his education in glass at the Vocational Glass School in Lausche. Uh, where they actually uh, have high school age kids who are learning to work glass at very high levels. Uh, they, they start off learning the traditional uh, glass Christmas ornaments that Lausche has become quite famous for. They, they first invented the glass Christmas ornament there in the, the mid 1800s. And uh, John learned to make ornaments. Those are some of the first things he ever learned, but uh, he really found his voice in figurative sculpture and he's particularly well known for his devil figures. And uh, he was working away this morning and made a male devil figure. And what he's gonna make for us this afternoon is a female figure to go with the, the male figure. And uh, John is working in soft glass. This is soda lime glass that comes from Lausche, Germany. There's uh, one glass factory in the center of this little mountain town that produces all the, the glass rods and tubes that the flame workers then use. And uh, those of you who are used to seeing red glasses might notice how brilliant this red is. Uh, that Lausche glass red is a particularly special version of red glass. And it works great for John's devil work. So he is working soda lime glass. Uh, probably a, a lot of folks watching on the internet are a bit more used to either seeing us work with borosilicate glass or working borosilicate themselves. And uh, we don't often see people sculpting soda lime glass on the torch at the scale that John works at. I, I know maybe of a handful of artists around the world who, who work on this scale at the torch with soda lime. It's very difficult to do. Uh, soda lime glass, if you heat or cool it too quickly or unevenly, will crack. Uh, so as you're working through a, a bigger sculpture, uh, if you're not working in just the right order and certain areas get cold and you try to go back to those areas with a hot flame, uh, this flame is probably pretty close to 3,000 Fahrenheit. If he goes into an area that's too cold, the glass will crack. So John works in a very specific order. He starts with the hip and the butt area gets that all built up. Then he starts to work down the legs, as you can see. And once he's got the legs finished, he'll start to work the upper body. Now, as we look at this red glass, it really tells us a lot about temperature. Uh, as the red gets hot, but not quite molten, it looks black. So when the glass is molten, it's that bright orange. But as that black starts to fade out, he knows those areas are getting cool, and it's gonna be hard to go back into those areas with heat. So that'll help you to sort of keep score as to where John can get back to within the sculpture through the process. So I'd like to welcome everybody to our live stream. Hello to the, the World Wide Web out there, and welcome to the Amphitheater Hot Shop here at the Corning Museum of Glass. Now, typically in our hot shop, you see us uh, working glass out of furnaces and, and larger ovens. Today, we have a, a very special guest artist here. So this is John Zinner, who is joining us from Lausche, Germany, to show us some of his beautiful figurative sculpture. It's a very unique opportunity for us to, to have John here. We're very excited. I first met John back in 2013. I was fortunate enough to visit over in Lausche and I made a, a couple of stops at some different, uh, different studios. And as I made my way through the town, everybody kept asking, well, have you met John Zinner yet? 
because he is uh, really a, a prized possession of the, the Laotian people over there. I uh, sort of refer to him as their rock star. John, uh, John's work has made its way all over Europe and all the way over here in the U.S. as well. And uh, he is a brilliant figurative sculptor. Comes from uh, a family tradition in glass making that goes back a couple of centuries. And at this point, he has finished the majority of the lower body. He's going to start working into the upper body. Now, notice where he's holding the glass relative to the flame. Now, he's trying to heat into glass that, has, that is room temperature, essentially. You can see from the really bright red that it's room temperature. He's way in the back of the flame with very gentle heat, trying to ease the heat back into that area so you can safely start to work in there. And this will allow him to start to build up the upper body off of the top of the hips. Controlling the heat, it breaks in the right spot. So you can continue to build. stage of trying to build up mass. And it gets pretty tricky to, to heat the glass at this point. You notice how John has to really turn the glass like a crankshaft. Because the figure itself isn't a centered form, it doesn't turn on uh, one horizontal axis, but he needs the glass to get heated uniformly so he can control the shape. So he's got to turn at these pretty awkward angles. That left hand sort of turns into a crankshaft as he heats up with the, the right hand and sort of feeds more material into that molten mass. Now you don't often see a soft glass sculpture on the torch that, the, that is of this scale because it's incredibly difficult to do. Uh, you need to be very accurate. You need to work quickly. Uh, you'll notice John works pretty quickly through the different body parts as he goes, and that, again, is because he needs the glass to stay warm where he's working. So it is important that he works at a, a certain pace. Now, the torch he's working on, there are probably some folks out there on the Internet land that are wondering about this torch. Uh, this comes from a company in Ilmenau, Germany, and uh, it's a gas, oxygen, and air torch. So it runs on natural gas. Uh, today, we are running it with a little bit of oxygen. And that gets that flame right around probably 3,000 Fahrenheit, maybe slightly hotter. Uh, if he adds in compressed air, we don't need to use quite so much oxygen, but we can still stay in the, the same temperature range. And uh, a really good torch to work soft glass over. Uh, it's not quite as hot as a, a lot of the torches we tend to see here in the U.S. where we melt a lot more borosilicate glass, so we tend to work more with propane and oxygen and work at much higher pressures. So just a, a different glass, a different temperature range. And glassworking is really all about temperature and timing, having the, the right temperatures in the right spots at the right times. Uh, John doesn't have the glass the right temperature when he goes to make the, the tail of the devil. He'll never get it stretched out and bent the way that uh, he likes to shape the tails. So when we get to that stage of the process, it'll be a very precise heating and stretching. He's also working with gravity as he goes here. That glass gets pretty soft, almost as soft as honey, so pretty fluid. And uh, if he were to stop turning when the glass is really glowing that bright orange, it's just going to start to drip and he'll lose control. So that's another reason for all that turning. He's got to control the material as well.
So another wonderful bonus about having John here today is the Corning Museum of Glass actually has a, a pretty long history with John's family. Uh, his father <coughs> was an artist featured in our New Glass show in 1979. And uh, was fortunate enough to, to meet John's father on my last trip to Laosha, which was last May. And uh, he was extremely excited to meet a couple of folks from the Corning Museum of Glass because when he had pieces in the 1979 show here, that was his first opportunity to come to this side of the, the curtain at that point. He, he hadn't been out of uh, Eastern territory at that point, so it made a, a huge impact on his life, his first opportunity. His artwork actually brought him out of East Germany and all the way to the US and uh, makes a, specializes in a type of work that's known as montage, which is hollow vessel forms with very finely detailed uh, pattern work to them. But John has found his own voice. Uh, he definitely learned quite a bit from his father, but uh, he very much has his own body of work, his own style of work. He's developed his own process for being able to sculpt soda lime glass like this on the torch. He's holding a piece of graphite. Graphite is a really handy material for a glass worker. Uh, it's very soft, so it's easy to cut or carve to, to any shape you might need. And it accepts the heat really well. Uh, it's not gonna, not gonna crack with too much heat. And it also doesn't stick to the molten glass. Uh, most other materials, as they heat up, they'll tend to stick to the glass. Graphite does not. So it's really handy for us glass workers. Uh, the catch is it is really soft and it does crack pretty easily. So uh, if you're making things like molds that you really need to hold up for a long time, graphite works for a bit, but you might be better off with uh, bronze or steel for a, a longer lasting mold than graphite. So now trying to, starting to build up the, the shoulder area, the back muscles. And now that John has moved away from the legs, he's not gonna go back. He, he can't go back into the thighs. And in the next few minutes, as we see the, the hip and the midsection come back to that bright red, he won't be able to go back with any heat to those areas either. So order of process, again, absolutely crucial. Now the, the legs on the, these devils are sort of made in uh, three parts. We generally think of a human leg as thigh and sort of calf and shin area and then the foot. And with John's devils, there's sort of an extra length uh, be below what would ordinarily be uh, seen as the calf. And at this point, he's only made two segments of the legs, but the base of the legs gets fairly narrow, so he'll be able to heat into the very tip of the leg safely as long as he does it slowly. There are a lot of interesting rules that glass sort of forces you into. But as you get a better feel for the material, you, you start to find ways to work around those rules. A lot of folks <clears throat> might be very knowledgeable about glass and would tell you that figures like this can't be made through this flame working process. And uh, the, the fact is, it just takes a very specific order of process to be able to get away with it. Here in the US, we have a, a lot more folks working in borosilicate glass, but in Europe, especially Central Europe, uh, there are a lot of folks who work soda lime glass. That's been their tradition for a long time, and they're, they're sticking with it. Uh, most of the artistic flame workers that I've met over in Europe do work in softer glasses. So setting up the chest and the breasts here.
you notice John gets these really nice flowing shapes. And that's, uh, I think, another big benefit to working in a, a softer glass. The glass really flows. He really gets it hot and soft enough that it flows. So it lends itself to really nice curves and those flowing sort of long forms on the legs and the arms. And it's helpful to have that nice flowing glass for the, the chest details as well. a lot of movement as John works. He's trying to get the heat in the right spots, get the glass flowing in the right direction using gravity effectively, and also making sure that flame doesn't hit any of those other areas of the sculpture that have started to cool down. So the, the more parts he gets attached, the less room he has for error. There's uh, sort of less room to get the flame in where he needs it without hitting those other more sensitive areas. John gets particularly nice detail around the, the upper chest and shoulders and collarbone. A lot of people don't pay quite the same level of attention to those details as he does. And uh, it really helps to accentuate the, the musculature. It just makes them a, a, a more finely detailed figure. It's all, always the finer points that make a big difference. So we have a question from the World Wide Web. People wondering if this glass has to be annealed. Uh, eventually, glass that is, that is melted should be annealed. It will take the stress out of the glass. John works in such a specific order as he's sculpting that he is relieving a lot of the stress as he goes. Uh, stress is built, in, built up in glass by uneven heating and cooling. So different areas are heated or cooled differently, so they expand and contract at different rates and they push and pull on each other. John works in an order where he's moving the heat around the piece such that there's, there's a gradient of temperature uh, allowing certain areas to cool uniformly as he more uniformly heats other areas and that more uniform cooling by moving the molten material and moving the flame through the sculpture at a, a pretty specific rate and pattern relieves a lot of stress in the glass. So he can get away with this work not being annealed. So it is possible and it survives just fine. And another question for the web, what torch is John working on? Uh, this is a gas, oxygen, and air torch from a, a company in Ilmenau, Germany. I think there's actually the Ilmenau, I, I forget the, the full name, but it's Ilmenau Glass Tools, uh, whatever the, sorry, the German version of that is. Uh, but they actually still produce torches and tools. And uh, this is a pretty popular burner design in Germany and the, the Czech Republic, but particularly Germany. So this probably doesn't burn quite as hot as a lot of gas oxygen burners that we're used to here in the US. Burns a, probably a little bit cooler than a, a lot of our torches over here, but it's perfect for soft glass. But it's at a, a nice soft surface mixed flame. It's nice and gentle on the glass. Another question for the web. 
how long does it take glass to cool? Depends on how thick it is. Uh, I know somebody was concerned that John was just working on the legs a few minutes ago, and now he's holding the figure by the legs. Well, those legs are cool enough to touch. Uh, it's not very thick in that leg area, so it cools within a few minutes, uh, maybe 10 or 15 minutes, it's cool to the touch. It just gives him a, a better grip on things. Uh, as you can imagine, as off-center as this object is, with just that one handle off the end that's maybe eight millimeter in diameter, it takes more torque to try to move the whole piece with that thin handle. So he's got much better control with the grip around the legs there. So now building in a little bit, bit of material for the neck, getting that started in here. You can see he's got the shoulders set up for a very wide arm position. If your, your arms are up in a figurative piece, your shoulders are going to be up, and the further up your arms are, the, the further up those shoulders are going to get. So you start to get a an idea of where he's going with this piece. So now that he's in that sort of shoulder and neck and head area, he cannot go back to that midsection with any heat. Uh, if he tries to heat back into the hip area, the whole piece would explode. One spot would expand faster than the rest of it, and it would just send a shock wave through everything. So another question from the web. Can you use different types of glass in the same piece, or will they explode? Uh, different types of glass is a pretty broad concept. Uh, glass compatibility generally relates to how much the glass expands and contracts with heating and cooling. We call that coefficient of thermal expansion, uh, or COE or CTE. Uh, typically, glasses need to be within uh, a scale of three points uh, on that scale of, uh, of CTE to be able to be compatible with, them, with one another. There are other glasses from other producers that John could mix with this Lauscha glass. Uh, Effetre, the, the glass that you find from Murano, Italy, most of that is compatible with most Lauscha glass. Um, but if we tried to mix borosilicate with this, the whole thing would certainly explode. Uh, if we tried to mix this glass with the glass we use in our furnace here, it would also explode. The glass in our furnace is a, a 96 COE. Uh, what John's using, this Lauscha glass, is a 104. So they're pretty far apart on that scale. So uh, you, you could mix some other glasses with this, but they need to expand and contract at uh, close enough rates that they'll hold together. So John's already sort of carved in some of the armpit detail before he starts to, to build out the bicep. Really smart way to go about it. And it's a matter of sort of building up a thick mass, getting that thick mass uniformly heated, and then slowly letting that stretch out. He's using gravity a little bit as he hangs the glass to let that material flow down into the bicep. With some glasses to make a, a longer appendage like an arm, we might heat a length of the rod rather than building up a ball. This Lauscha glass doesn't really like it so much if you heat a length of it. It will tend to crack at the, the outer extent of that length. So it's a little bit smarter to work this glass into a big ball for a mass and then slowly work that molten ball out into a, a cylinder for an arm. 
to, to make these longer appendages. So different glasses we might approach differently with our, our, our sculptural instincts. This is a, another good question. How many years has John been making glass for? Thirty-five years. So, yeah, been at it a little while. So I guess he started when he was two. Must be. No, maybe a little older than that. But in Laosha, that wouldn't surprise me so much. I know they start pretty early. So again, building up mass trying to eye out how much material that ball needs to be so that when he stretches the ball, it becomes the right diameter for the, the bicep. So there are some advantages to making these figures as expressive and sort of dynamic as they are. It's helpful as he's making this arm that he doesn't have the rest of the figure too close to the flame. Uh, if he had an arm that were sort of wrapped in around the midsection really close to it, he'd risk splashing the flame into the midsection of the figure and getting that to crack. So there are some definite advantages of having those arms spread further apart. It gives them a little more room to work in there and it gives you a very expressive, very dynamic posture. So another question off of the web, is this the largest work that he makes or does he go any larger? He goes quite a bit larger. Uh, I know I saw a, uh, an image of a skeleton piece that looked like it was probably a couple feet tall. Uh, he likes to make some alien figures that are similar to sort of Geiger style uh, alien figures. And I know some of those get enormous as well, a, a couple of feet in height. So yeah, an all hot attached soda lime glass. Very difficult work. Really have to think through your process as you grow the scale with soft glass like this. All right, and another question about compatibilities in glass. Uh, if the coefficients of expansion are far enough apart, could it be dangerous to the glass worker? Huh, that's an interesting question. I guess in theory it, it could be dangerous. Um, while the glass is hot and molten as you're working it, it's not likely to explode at that point. Uh, you're, you're more likely to run into the more violent breakage issues when the glass is cooling, so when it's already out of the, the glass worker's hand. So I'm going to give a very uh, sort of reserved no. It's not hugely dangerous to the glass worker to mix the, the compatibilities as long as they're not around the glass as it's cooling. Because that's, uh, as you get through the strain point around 900 degrees, that's where the, the most violent cracking is going to happen. Another web question here. So when John switches from thicker rods to thinner rods, um, I, I'm going to miss part of the question here, but what are, what are advantages or disadvantages? Why might he switch from a thicker rod to a thinner rod? Well, 
it's very hard to make really fine details from a big, thick mass. So when John wants to build up thicker masses, he works with the thicker rods. Uh, it's just faster. Uh, you're, you're heating more material much faster that way. But when he wants to get into the really fine details, as he gets into the details of the head, as we're going to see in a couple of minutes here, he will switch to thinner rods. It just gives him better control over the finer details. So that's his reasoning for having a, a few different sizes of material on the bench here. Oh, the internet is buzzing with questions today. Not bad. We like that. We also take questions from our live audience, if you guys have any. <laughs> Feel free to shout them out. So I'm curious if anybody is watching over in Laosha, if they'll shoot us a message. Are you getting any messages from Laosha? Yeah. Uh, Uwe and Georg? Yeah. All right. Got a few folks. Are, are people watching at the Gallo? Nice. All right. Yeah. We have a few folks uh, tuning in from Germany. Excellent. Uh, they have sort of one central watering hole that uh, the whole town seems to hang out at that John's brother owns the bar and is the, the bartender there. So I, I imagine they're all watching right now. You want to you wave to them? <laughs> Say hello. <laughs> yeah, very excited to have an opportunity to have John here. I first met him in 2013, and we, uh, we crossed paths again last year when I was over in Laosha, and we had talked about trying to find an opportunity for him to come and work here, and he does come to the U.S. a couple times a year, and uh, thankfully our, our dates worked out. We had the, the amphitheater open today, and we have the, the pleasure of having John uh, make his incredible work here today. So now we're going to start to really get into some, some detailed sculpting here. At this point, he's focused just on the head. He's not going to go back to any of the other details below the neck. Uh, eventually, he will work out to the arms. But the arms are further away from the mass of the body. And when he wants to heat into the arms, he can very slowly heat into the tip of the elbow and be safe. But at this stage, we want to keep it heat away from other areas focus where the real detail is going to happen. Popular question from our internet crowd, what torch is John working on? Uh, he is working on a gas air oxygen burner from Ilmenau, so the Ilmenau torch and, and glass tools company. Actually bought a few tools when I was there in 2013. They make uh, burners that are similar in design, design to what we see uh, more from the Herbert Arnold Company here in the U.S. I don't know that the Ilmenau Company does any uh, exporting here. I, I don't think they do. So now you really get an idea of why John works with different size rods, trying to get in fine details. He's got a much thinner rod, so he can really get in there and create those details. How do you spell the German torch company's name? Ilmenau. I-L-M-E-N-A-U? Yes, I got it right. Ilmenau. And uh, if you look on a map, it is pretty close to Laosha. I, I remember about a half hour drive through the Thuringian forest to get from Laosha to Ilmenau. It's a, actually a really beautiful drive through pine forests. You live in a beautiful area, John. <laughs> uh, 
uh, on this last trip to, to Laosha. We were traveling from Dresden to Laosha on May 10th. And May 10th is a, a special day in Thuringia. It's called Menerstag, which is man's day. And uh, what happens on Menerstag is the guys load up a backpack with uh, their favorite libations and head for a hike in the woods and go, go have some drinks in the woods. And then uh, eventually they, they come back to town and the town gets pretty energized. <laughs> so as we were driving through these crazy hilly roads, uh, through these really steep mountains in Thuringia, uh, first thing in the morning, maybe eight in the morning, we're seeing groups of guys with backpacks on already well into their festivities and, and headed off to the woods. It was uh, it's a pretty unique scene, I have to say. You guys know how to celebrate. So really carved in some details, sort of setting up cheekbone lines and eye socket lines and now building around those areas, trying to build in that really fine detail that is well known for on these beautiful devil sculptures. see a lot of different approaches to, to sculpture. And uh, I know some folks who will tend to just build up a mass for a head and then move that material around and sort of carve into it until they get, they get the details they want for a, a head and a face. And then uh, you see a, a different approach here with John where he's adding a lot of material to build out the details that he's after. The internet is curious to know what color red John is using. This is the opaque red that the Farbglasuta Lausha produces. So this is made in Lausha at their factory there. Uh, it's a 104 COE, beautiful opaque red. And uh, I, I really have not seen many reds like this. It's uh, really beautiful, stays brilliant and vibrant after multiple heatings. It's a, a really great red. If, you're, if you work in the, the 104 COE palette, I highly recommend checking it out. Uh, definitely is imported here to the US, so you, you can find it. So John's going to press in the, the eye socket here. We had major concerns earlier today where we weren't sure where this uh, eye socket tool was. So you get into these habits as a, a maker where that right tool is the right tool. You, you need that to make your detail the way it is your signature to make your work. It makes a big difference. It's, uh, if, you, if you ever cooked in somebody else's kitchen and you're forced to use other utensils in a different space, it's, it's different. It's, it's not like working in your own kitchen. Same deal with a glass studio. All right, a couple more questions from the, the web. Uh, does this red have gold in it, or what else might be in uh, glass to make a red glass? Is that pretty accurate, Amanda? Mm -hmm. So this red is a gold chloride-based red. Um, there's, I almost wonder if maybe there's some cadmium in this red as well. Uh, opaque reds you will see some cadmium added in different compositions. Uh, you can also get a red glass by adding copper oxide, 
but a copper red tends to be a little more on the, the brownish side. Uh, in borosilicate glass, a really dense opaque red is going to be cadmium based. So there are a few different ways to make a red glass. What was the other question? Yeah, the other question was, does John draw out his work or is it sort of a freestyle thing? It's mostly a freestyle thing. Um, he uh, doesn't, hasn't drawn these out, but he's made figures like these many times. So he definitely has a vision in his head as to where he's going, but there is some improvisation as he goes along. There, there are definitely times when he, uh, he'll make some impromptu design decisions. But yeah, this, this piece that he's working on, he hasn't drawn out, but he knows exactly where he's going with it. So now adding the, the devil's horns. He even added a little bit of texture to the horn sort of lapping the glass back over itself, creating a, an uneven bit of material, and then twisting. So you get a, a light bit of texture on these horns. A lot of subtleties to what John's up to here. So for those of you just joining us here, uh, welcome to the Hot Glass Amphitheater here at the Corning Museum of Glass. Uh, we are currently live streaming our demo on the internet, so uh, you might hear me talking to the internet crowd a little bit. And uh, typically in this shop, we have traditional furnace style glass blowing. We've got our big furnaces and big ovens back here, and typically you're gonna see us making uh, bowls, vases, some small sculptures in here, some goblets. But today we have a very unique opportunity. We have a, a visiting artist with us. This is John Zinner. And he is visiting from Lausche, Germany, which is a, a town in eastern Germany in the, the Thuringian Mountains that has a very long tradition of glassmaking, stretches all the way back to 1597. And uh, John comes from a family with several generations of glass workers. And uh, he is most well known for his figurative sculpture and particularly his devils. And uh, this morning he made this incredibly expressive male devil and he is now working on a, a female that will be paired up with the male. So working on the, the details of the head right now, adding the, the horns. A lot of detail on the, the heads and the faces of his devils as well. So the torch John is working on, uh, it's built in Ilmenau, Germany, which is pretty close to Lausche, about 30 minutes away. And it runs on gas, oxygen, and compressed air. Yeah. Okay. So I mentioned temperature and timing are absolutely crucial with glass work. And uh, this work in particular, temperature and timing is absolutely crucial. Somebody was asking earlier how long it takes for glass to cool. Well, it depends on how thick the glass is. The, the thicker it is, the more thermal mass you have, the, the, the longer it's going to hold temperature. There are points where John needs to hold parts of the sculpture in his hand. So you can really grip it properly, work at the, the proper angles. And uh, at this point, we need the head to cool down. So then he can uh, grab sort of the, the upper midsection, continue on the, the legs from there. So we are in a little bit of a holding pattern for a few minutes here. We're gonna let this cool for a, a few minutes. Uh, if anybody on the web has questions, this is a particularly good time to hit us with some questions. And so uh, another addition to, to John's work setup here is uh, he has 
a, a little burner on the, the top of the bench that has just a little gas flame going. That's just straight natural gas flame. And uh, it's really important that he pre-warms the tips of the rods that he's working from. Uh, if he doesn't, as he puts that glass right into the 4,000, or sorry, 3,000 degree torch flame, the glass just starts cracking and it'll shatter little bits all over the place. So that, that pre-warmer is something that you will see really in every, every flame working studio in Lausche and, and many across Germany. Uh, Preheating your glass is a crucial component. And there are other soda lime glasses that are similar to the glass from Lausche that you can get away with heating them gently in the torch flame and, and you'd be okay. You can sort of get away with it. My experience with the Lausche glass, you cannot cheat it like you can with uh, some other glasses. It really requires this, this pre-warming. So we have some more questions from the web about annealing and how are we able to get away with not annealing these sculptures. Uh, the, the male devil John made this morning. It's been sitting out in the open air since noon and it's just fine. Now, glass will crack because of temperature differentials. Uh, if you have really hot glass, it's expanding or swelling. If you have really cold glass, it's not moving. And that hot glass will expand beyond where it can stay attached to the cold glass. Uh, as John works, he works in a very specific order, moving the heat from one area to the next. As he moves the heat from one area to the next, it's also cooling uniformly behind where he is applying the heat. The whole deal with glass not cracking with temperature is that it cools evenly. It doesn't matter that it cools in the open air or cools in an oven. If the glass is cooling evenly and uniformly, that will help to relieve a lot of the stress. Now, there, there may still be some residual stress in there, but uh, it's, it's so little that it's really not an issue with objects like these. So these are, these are holding up just fine. Uh, if they were clear and we were to put them in a polariscope, it probably would show quite a bit of stress. But uh, these survive just fine. John's been uh, working figures like this for a couple of decades now, and they do just fine. So we can see the, the color sort of fading out of the, the female devil here, that red getting brighter in her, her head and the, the upper chest and, and shoulder area. And once that cools down enough that we can grab on there with a bare hand, which will be just a couple more minutes, uh, John will dive in. He'll make the, the lower part of the legs, get the hooves on there, and uh, then he can work up on the arms. And I've been talking about moving the heat very uniformly around the piece and letting certain areas warm up evenly, letting other areas cool down evenly behind that. Now, he's going to go back into some fairly thick spots, the, the ends of the, the biceps where the, the elbow is. That glass is pretty thick there. But he's going to ease into those areas very gently with the heat, and he can actually watch how the, the color in the glass changes as it, that red gets more livery and eventually gets to, to look almost black. He knows it's warm enough. He can get more aggressive with the torch. So uh, just knowing the nature of how the, the glass colorizes uh, as he's heating it he has a pretty good idea when he can apply heat, when he can't. And by setting up certain shapes and by setting up the, the points on the ends of the, the bicep, makes for an easier shape to heat into. So there's a, a lot of subtleties that you can get away with. Yep. You have a question? Excellent. <laughs> does John, does John? Mm -hmm. Yeah, does John travel a lot? How much time does he spend back in Lausche versus traveling the rest of the world? Well, I know he's here in the U.S. for six weeks on this trip. And uh, aside from when he comes to the U.S., he's mostly at home, right? Yeah. He's so maybe a third of his year he's traveling? Really? Oh, well. So apparently about a third of the year he's at home. The rest of the year he's on the road. 
Yeah, so he comes here to the U.S. a couple times a year uh, and travels throughout Europe for exhibitions, for making work, for demonstrations. So he keeps keeps pretty busy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's tr a tricky balance of getting more work done and developing new work, yet still making it to exhibitions and, and being able to promote your work enough. So not a not an easy balance there. So is there a meaning to John's devils or is it just something that he likes to create? Uh, I know he sees a lot of himself within the devils. So that uh, I know is part of the influence. And uh, we'll, we'll check back in with him in a minute to see if there's a, a deeper meaning as well. I, I believe there is a, a bit more meaning to them. And uh, I know he also loves the fact that he gets this beautiful red glass to be able to make the devils with too. So uh, there, there definitely is more beneath the surface of the devils with John. So there's a, another question from the web wondering if you work borosilicate glass through a same order of process as to what John does with soda lime, uh, could you get away with the, the similar annealing habits that John has? Oh, absolutely you can. Uh, I can tell you from personal experience that I, I sculpt my human figures in a, a very similar order in borosilicate and it saves you a, a lot of trouble. Uh, you really can get away without uh, needing to work in and out of an oven the whole time. So if you just work in a, a proper order, you're moving the, the heat to the right spots at the right times, uh, you really can make some enormous sculptures without worrying about annealing as you're working. Uh, you may choose to anneal after the fact, and I certainly do, but uh, you, can, you can get away with making some massive objects uh, and not having to work in and out of the oven the whole time. All right, so we're cool enough that John will be able to dive back in here and continue to work away on the female devil figure. Uh, so now cool enough that he can grip where he needs to to really control everything. So we've got a, another question for the web. Uh, what is the most difficult piece John has worked on? The, the biggest, more, most difficult? Yeah, so he, John made a, an alien piece, and he, he makes a, a series of aliens that uh, are sort of influenced by Geiger's aliens, if you're familiar with those, like the, the movie Alien. And uh, John made an alien style figure that is a couple feet tall. And a lot of the parts are sort of weaved in amongst each other. Very complex piece, very large piece. So that uh, certainly is, if, if not the most difficult piece, certainly one of the most difficult pieces he's made. Uh, growing the scale makes things more difficult. And also the, the intricacy of detail on the piece makes it extremely difficult. So now heating in to the tip of that bicep. So I mentioned he started with very gentle heat, sort of towards the back of the flame. He watches the color of the glass. As that bright red starts to go a little more livery to black, he knows it's safely warmed, that he can apply uh, the, the more intense heat deeper into the torch flame. What you'll notice as he works this area, he's not going to go anywhere near the midsection. Now, if this torch flame hits that midsection, the whole thing is just going to explode. 
do not need that. Uh, somebody asked earlier on the web uh, if there's a, a danger to the artist combining different uh, expansion rate glasses. And uh, it's not much of an issue when the glass is hot and molten. Uh, it's, it's able to move uniformly with the other glass. But uh, if John let two glasses that didn't match up well actually cool on the bench, that could become dangerous. That, that would crack, and it could crack violently enough to shoot some shards around the workspace. So it is possible. So building up mass, trying to get it uh, worked into the elbow area so it's nice and uniform through the elbow. But now he'll start to warm up that big thick mass to stretch it and elongate it. And again, it's a, a matter of timing. Setting up a uniform enough heat that the shape will pull out to the proper shape, but also getting the timing right so the glass isn't too soft. If he tries to stretch it and the glass is too soft, it's going to be so soft it drips and gets out of control. So as he's stretching, he's sort of feeling out how much that glass is moving, using gravity a little bit to let it sort of fall to where he wants it to fall to. temperature and timing. And at this point, you see how far John's hand has crept up the, the devil's body, so he has a good grip to really control it for adding the arms. Uh, if he tried to grab that area eight minutes ago, wouldn't have worked out very well. Would have been way too hot. Starting to set up a little material for the hand, just right off the end of the arm. And again, the, the coloration or discoloration of the glass really gives you an idea where that heat is. Uh, you see the, the bicep on that left arm, it's sort of blackish about halfway along it. If that blackish tone were to get all the way to the shoulder, we'd be in trouble. So another question from the web. <clears throat> Why is John not wearing a face shield and gloves? Uh, well, first of all, uh, he doesn't need a face shield. It's not that hot or around his face. Uh, and he's not really creating too many shards, so we don't have to worry too much about a face shield. Uh, and as far as gloves go, John really needs his dexterity. And uh, if he had gloves on, it would really inhibit that dexterity. He's going to make some really fine details here. And uh, he needs to really feel that glass. He needs to be able to control it in his fingertips. And also, glass is an insulator. It doesn't conduct heat. So even though he's getting one end of that rod 2,300 Fahrenheit, just a couple inches away from that area where he's applied the heat is room temperature. So glass is a lousy conductor of temperature. It's actually a very good insulator. That's why we use it for insulation in our homes. So yeah, it's actually pretty rare to see a, a glass worker wearing gloves. Usually we need that dexterity, we need that feel too much, and the, the gloves really get in the way. He makes such a expressive, delicate hands. I love it. The, the long fingers sort of really make them extra expressive, I think. So if you're wondering what's going on here, uh, we are in the, the hot glass amphitheater here at the Corning Museum of Glass. And typically in this space, 
you are going to see furnace style glass blowing. We use these big ovens and big pipes and rods and uh, make larger objects, uh, things like bowls and vases, like what you see on the end of the stage here. But uh, we've got a, a very unique day today. We have a, a special visiting artist, John Zinner, who comes to us from Lausche, Germany, which is a, a mountain town in Thuringia in eastern Germany that has a centuries-old tradition in glassmaking. And uh, John comes from a family tradition of several generations of glass workers. Uh, he has been working glass 35 years himself. And he is very well known for his figurative sculpture. And uh, so this morning, John made the, the male devil figure that you see on the, the front of the bench. And now we're getting his mate, the, the female over here. And really getting into these very fine details. So with furnace work, uh, you tend to see larger scale work, uh, things like the bowls and vases that I pointed to on the front of the stage. The equipment lends itself well to making larger, heavier, bigger volume work. Flame working, what John's doing here, lends itself really well to fine detail work. Since he can aim the heat just where he needs to get the glass moving, but he can keep the flame away from other areas where he doesn't want the sculpture moving, gives him a lot of control over detail. And he really takes advantage of that with, uh, with this figurative sculpture the details on the face, and especially the, these really delicate fingers on the hand. There's no other process that you're going to use to make such details. The, the torch is really the way to do it. So another question from the web. This is a tricky one. Is European glass different than American glass? Uh, so I'm not entirely sure if you're referring to raw materials or finished objects. Uh, as far as raw materials go, there's not really that much of a difference. Uh, in the US, flame workers tend to work more with borosilicate glass, so that would be one major difference. Uh, but uh, the same objects are entirely possible in, in either glass, either soda lime or borosilicate. Um, yeah, we don't we don't produce much soda lime glass for flame working in this country. There's a lot more borosilicate produced in this country for flame working, so there are definitely some differences. Okay, we just got a clarification. Raw materials. Uh, uh, pretty much the same raw materials are available in Europe as are available here in the U.S. It's, a, it's definitely a, a global industry. So the, the glass that John is working with, that gets imported here to the U.S. You can purchase Lausche glass from distributors here in the U.S. And you can purchase American-made glasses from European distributors as well. So it's, it's all out there and available. So moving on to our other arm. Now, you notice John worked one arm all the way through to the hand and the fingers. Finished that entirely. Now he's moved over to the, the second arm. The benefit to working in that order is that arm that he finished the hand on stayed warm the whole time. So he took one risky moment of warming into the tip of the bicep once he's safely warmed in there and gotten that material attached that he will then shape out for the forearm, he's got heat in that area. So it's safe to continue working in that area. If he lets that area cool down and then comes back with heat again, it's another risk. Uh, anytime you're heating from room temperature back up to molten, uh, you're risking cracking something. So once he safely gets the heat back into an area, he wants to finish working that area, and then he can move to the, the next spot that might also be cold. So again, moving temperature, uh, a very specific order. So 
Uh, the web is filling us with questions. Perfect. So uh, somebody wondering if John has ever tried to make these figures in borosilicate. Uh, don't think so. No, he, he tends to stick with this soda lime glass. This stuff is made right in the center of his hometown. So uh, why not just stick with this glass? And Amanda? Uh, another question from the web, are there some types of glass that are more expensive than others? Yes, absolutely. Uh, there are different ingredients that can be added to different glasses that will make them work differently. Different ingredients cost different amounts of money, hence the, the finished products cost uh, different amounts. Uh, a quick comparison. Uh, the rods that John is working with here, this beautiful red, uh, what does that cost per kilo? Maybe 50 bucks a kilo, somewhere around there. Uh, whereas a, a similar red in borosilicate is going to be about twice that. So that, that gives you an idea of the, the potential range. And we, uh, we also do a demonstration here on making prosthetic glass eyes. And that glass also comes from Lausha. And the red that's used for the veins on a glass eye for prosthetics is 2,200 euro per kilo. That was the most expensive craft glass I've ever seen listed in a catalog by, by far. So yes, different glass types can certainly have uh, quite a broad range in expense. Yes, ma'am. Do we have any of John's work for sale here in Corning? We certainly do. Uh, as you walk out to our sort of lobby area and just enter the, the glass market, you will notice there are some vertical cases as you're starting to walk in. The first case is right there. We've got several of John's pieces. Yep, there are uh, a few different dancer figures in there. Yeah, yep, have a, a nice selection of stuff. And it's, uh, his, there are plenty of folks who try to make figurative work in glass, but John has a very distinct style, very distinct voice in his work. It's uh, usually, uh, if you see a lot of work, it's, it's pretty recognizable in, amongst a, a sea of figurative work. So another question from the web. How easy or difficult is it to work with crystal? Uh, so you won't typically see crystal worked on the torch. Uh, crystal, uh, I should back up a little bit. Crystal is simply a, a different type of glass. Uh, crystal is typically a glass that has a lot of either lead oxide or barium oxide added to it, which makes it more clear and more brilliant. Um, because it is more brilliant, more, more clear, it will show defects that much more brilliantly. So any sort of a defect is really magnified in crystal. As you heat crystal on the torch, oftentimes you will affect the surface of the glass. You might bubble it a little bit. You might get some tiny little bubbles in there that in some glasses you might not see bubbles of that size. Crystal is so brilliant, it magnifies those bubbles and you really see them. So it is not typically worked on the torch because oftentimes you affect the surface that way. Um, so even working in other processes, Crystal can be a bit more difficult because of the optics, because of how brilliant it is, and the fact that it does show any defect severely. So uh, when you're working crystal, you tend to work it very cleanly. Uh, you make sure you're not getting in any dust into the glass as you're working. You, you keep uh, your studio facility very clean. 
some crystal companies will not even gather the glass out of a furnace in multiple layers like you typically would uh, in, a, in a furnace process. They'll rather uh, pour the glass into uh, sort of a mold that you then stuff the pipe into the glass and take the whole mass of glass in one shot. Uh, yeah, so there, are, there definitely are some difficulties to working crystal as opposed to working other glasses. And, and most of that, again, relates to the, the quality of the optics of the glass. It just, you can't hide any blemishes at all. So uh, it needs to be worked very particularly. And Amanda thought I couldn't answer that question. <laughs> All right, so this is another one of those parts where we need the, the temperature to balance out a little bit. The, the next move is to work on the, the lower legs here. John wants to grab up towards the, the head and the chest area to be able to really handle things here. So we want that to cool down for a couple of minutes there. And again, timing, absolutely crucial with this stuff. So we can get a, a feel for how these figures are going to be coordinated together here. You can see her posture is really arched back. His posture, he's got that one hand way up. And I believe the way we're going is that she is going to lay across that hand. So I suspect he will have to uh, adjust the fingers on that hand a bit so that it will support the, the female figure. But I, I haven't seen how John uh, gets this all together here, so I'm in the dark as well. So back to the, the topic of crystal that used to be a very important topic in this space here. Uh, this space that we're in used to be the Stuben Glass Factory, which was very well known for very high quality crystal. And uh, their, uh, their, their process of eliminating seconds was one of the most stringent things I think I've ever seen. Uh, some of the work that they would reject because of tiny blemishes that the human eye wouldn't even see or the, the naked eye wouldn't see, they would go over it with a microscope and a, 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 a jeweler's loop to inspect. And uh, it's amazing what, get, what would get tossed out from that factory just trying to keep that, that really high level of quality for crystal. Uh, again, it just shows blemishes so easily. Why did Stuben stop? Uh, market influences it became a very difficult business. It's a, an extreme luxury good. And uh, so that market shrunk a bit. And also they had competition. There, there were other companies popping up that were also melting some fabulous glass. So they went, they tried to, uh, the company was sold for a little bit to Schottenstein LLC, which is a luxury goods company. Uh, they stopped producing Stuben a few years back, but Stuben has since been re-released, and the only place to get Stuben glass is through the Corning Museum of Glass. So they are on a, a, a bit of a different business model, a, smaller production lines, and uh, just a sort of a, a smaller business model. And that glass is still made in this area now. So the Stuben glass does still exist. So where does John get the inspiration for his work? Mm -hmm. All right, so John uh, reads a lot of mythology. So a lot of Greek mythology and uh, yeah, and different bits of mythology make their way into his work. So it certainly makes sense with what we're seeing here. And it seems like he makes up some, some of his own mythology with the alien figures as well. He's sort of reinterpreting and, uh, and coming up with some modern mythology, if you will. All right, so now he does actually have black glass in his hands. 
and make the, the hooves for the, the devil. So the hoof is sort of a, a unique form. It's got this slender curve that kind of builds out to the, the big, thicker area that actually makes contact with the ground. So it's a unique shape to try to set up, to, to start it fairly thin coming off of the ankle and then build up the, the added thickness for the, the tip of the hoof. John makes that all look pretty simple and natural, but uh, that'll happen when you've been making these figures for a couple of decades. So another question from the web. Uh, is there an oxide making the flame go red? So what is making the flame go sort of a, an orangey red uh, is sodium burning out of the glass. So this is a, a very natural thing with uh, any sodium-based glass. Uh, as you heat it up, some of the sodium is released and we get that orange flame. We call that soda flare. And John actually doesn't see any of that orange while he's working. Uh, the glasses that he's wearing uh, have a material in the lenses that's known as didymium. Didymium happens to filter that range of orange light. So he is able to really see through there, see the details well. Uh, sometimes we do put a, a filter on our cameras. It really makes it tricky to see the, the lighting of everything else that's around the flame. So we opt not to uh, filter our cameras for flame working of this nature. So another awesome bit of detail that John adds on to the, the female devil are the sort of the high-heeled hooves. Love that. I think that's such a great touch. So again, he's heating into a cold part of the figure but it's a part of the figure that's fairly thin and it's way further away from the thicker areas. And he starts by warming it way out at the tip of the flame, just very gentle heat. But again, with this red glass, he can watch the color of the glass. As it starts to go a little bit livery to black, then he knows it's warm enough that he can safely get aggressive with the flame and nothing's gonna crack, or at least not that area. And it's interesting, a, a lot of us American flame workers consider this to be such a, a rare thing to see somebody sculpting with soda lime glass on the torch. This is, this is what has been happening in Europe for centuries now. I mean, John takes it to a much higher level than has been done for a long time, but uh, this sort of sculpting on a, a focused flame with soda lime glass has been going on for a few centuries in Europe. So this is uh, a fairly natural thing that people would expect, uh, at least this sort of a, a setup, not necessarily this scale and this quality of work, but uh, as far as flame working soda lime glass into sculpture, uh, it tends to be fairly uncommon here in the US, but it's extremely common in, in Europe. Borosilicate glass didn't come around until the, the late 1800s, so 
Soda lime is what they had to work with, so you, you figure out how to make it work. For some of the folks in the audience, I'm talking about borosilicate and soda lime glasses. Well, there are different compositions of glass. By adding different ingredients into the recipe, we can change a lot of the characteristics of the glass. Uh, if we add some different oxides, like adding gold chloride to the glass, we get a beautiful red. Uh, if we add boron oxide to the glass, uh, it doesn't expand and contract so much with temperature change. Uh, so it makes for a glass that doesn't react so severely with temperature change. Uh, so soda lime glass is the most common glass on the planet. Uh, typically about 70 to 75 percent uh, silica, uh, very pure silica content sand. Uh, typically that sand would come from a sandstone mine where we know the purity of the, the silica content. Uh, add to that some soda ash to help the, the uh, silica melt at a lower temperature. So we call that a flux. And uh, when you add the soda ash and add that flux, it actually makes the glass water soluble. So it'll start to break down with exposure to moisture, even just the moisture in the air. So typically one would add some limestone to that. And that would stabilize the glass so it doesn't break down with with moisture, so that's a, a soda lime glass, the most common glass on the planet. But uh, if you take out some of the soda ash and limestone and add in some boron oxide and some alumina and a, a few other micro ingredients, uh, you're gonna wind up with a borosilicate glass. So a, a borosilicate glass we would tend to use uh, for objects that need to resist quick temperature changes. So things like laboratory wear for a, a scientific lab. Uh, cookware is going to tend to be borosilicate if it's intended to get hot. And I, I mentioned crystal a little bit earlier. So crystal, uh, rather than having the, the soda ash, is going to tend to have uh, lead oxide or barium oxide. And that is going to make the, the optics of the glass a bit different, make it more brilliant and more clear. Yeah, so we adjust the ingredients in glasses all the time to get different properties out of the glass. And we can add different ingredients to make a glass softer or stiffer while it's at different temperatures. So the, the glass John has here, this is a soda lime glass. And it's pretty soft. It, uh, you get this stuff hot enough, it will really drip just like honey, even after you come out of the flame. So for those of you just joining us, uh, first of all, welcome to the Hot Glass Amphitheater here at the Corning Museum of Glass. And you have joined us on a particularly special day. Uh, typically here in the amphitheater hot shop, you will see furnace style glass blowing. So we'll be using these big ovens back here, making bowls, vases, some uh, small sculptures, maybe some goblets. Today, we have a very unique opportunity. We have a visiting artist with us. So this is John Zinner. And he is visiting us all the way from Lausche, Germany. Uh, Lausche is in the Thuringian region of eastern Germany. And uh, they have a very long history of glass making in Lausche. Uh, Lausche was originally settled in 1597 by a couple of families of migrant glass workers who were looking for a new area to set up a glass factory. So what do you need for a glass factory? Uh, the, you need certainly your raw materials for the glass. So there is a very high purity silica in the riverbeds around Lausche. You also need a fuel source to heat up that glass, to get it molten. Uh, the Thuringian region is heavily forested. So there are tons of trees to use for, uh, for furnaces, or at least when furnaces were heated with wood. So it's a perfect area to set up a new glass factory. And Lausche has been famous for its glass ever since. Uh, probably the most famous uh, glass product that has come out of Lausche would be the glass Christmas ornament. 
They were uh, first invented in Laotia back in the, the mid-1800s. And as the story goes, there was uh, uh, people typically at that time were decorating their, their holiday decorations were uh, nuts and berries and dried fruits, things like that, that they would string and, and place around the home or on the tree. And uh, in one particular season, there was a poor glassblower who could not afford to spare his food stash for the winter, for the holidays. But what he did have plenty of was glass. So he made himself some glass decorations for the home. And that is where the glass Christmas ornament was born. And since then, they've developed uh, new processes. They, uh, most of the ornaments that come from Laosha are mold blown. So there's a two-part mold of a very uh, tightly guarded secretive material that they still won't tell me exactly what's in there. The closest I've come to an answer is that it's a secret clay. Uh, I thought I was going to get the real answer, and then I was told secret clay, so it's an important secret. And uh, so there are two-part molds of a, must be a silica ceramic clay combination of some sort. And uh, so you, you can blow into these molds and they'll take on the, the shape of uh, different figures or even different patterns, uh, all those sort of fancy ornaments you used to see at Woolworths years ago. Anybody remember buying ornaments at Woolworths? Do we remember Woolworths? Yeah. Well, uh, J.W. Woolworth was actually a, uh, a huge importer of glass from Laotia, and he... Uh, was largely responsible for the growth of their ornaments uh, around the world. Used to go over to Laotia and buy boatloads of ornaments and, and bring them back to the US. And Corning Incorporated actually plays a little bit of a role in the, the ornament story through history. Uh, Laotia sits in the eastern part of Germany and there we're just on the eastern border of the wall for, for many years. And uh, of course, during World War II, we weren't getting products from Germany over here, but people still wanted their traditional ornaments. So Corning Incorporated retrofitted a, uh, a factory in Wellsboro, Pennsylvania, a little ways away from here. They had a, a machine called a ribbon machine that makes light bulbs incredibly quickly, like thousands per minute. And if you put a different mold on the machine, it will blow a ball rather than a bulb. And uh, so they filled that gap of holiday ornaments through World War II by cranking out clear ornaments on their ribbon machine and then uh, selling them to a few different companies to then decorate them and, and put them out for sale. So a unique sort of combination of uh, Laosha and Corning through that tradition. Another interesting glass thing that was really perfected in Laotia are prosthetic glass eyes. Uh, prosthetic glass eyes, the, the earliest ones we know of were mid-1500s coming from Venice, Italy, which is no surprise. The Venetians came up with a lot of firsts in glass. And uh, then we hear about some French glass makers who are making prosthetic eyes in the 1700s and into the 1800s. And uh, there were said to be some issues with the glasses they were using. They were using uh, soda lime and or lead-based glasses. And those glasses would actually start to dissolve with exposure to tears. So over time, the surface gets rough. You're blinking your eyelid over that rough surface. You get irritated. You get infected. You got a whole new issue for somebody who already needed a prosthetic in the first place. So. In uh, 1835, there was a, a German glass worker in Laotia, Ludwig Müller Uri. He was approached by a local ophthalmologist who was looking for a better alternative for his patients, for their prosthetics. Well, Müller Uri would uh, make products like eyes for dolls and for taxidermy. So he was already sort of on that path a little bit. And he worked with this ophthalmologist to learn more about the physiology of the eye and, and what the, the patient's needs really were. And so he came up with a process for making very accurately detailed eyes and also worked with the glass chemists at the factory in Laotia to develop more stable glasses that would hold up better with exposure to tears. 
So Lausche at that point really became the center for prosthetic eyes. And uh, the glasses they engineered, they would sell to eye makers all around the world. And uh, so they, they really were the world experts in, in prosthetic eyes. Uh, eventually, an another issue, World War II rolled around. And uh, even though there were eye makers here in the US, they couldn't get the materials from Lausche to make the eyes properly. And we're at war, so we have soldiers coming home with injuries. They need prosthetics. And so the US government developed a program to come up with a different material for these prosthetics. And what they landed on was acrylic. So nowadays, most of the uh, prosthetic eyes you'll see in most of the world are acrylic. But you do still see plenty of glass eyes in Germany and Czech Republic and Austria and those countries around Central Europe that were still getting goods from, from Germany through the war. So interesting bit of influence there. A little bit louder? Ah, what is he doing now? He is making a sculpture of these two devil figures here. So John actually started this piece at about 10 this morning, made the, the male devil, devil figure through the course of the morning. And now the, the female is pretty much done. Yeah, so now we need to adjust the hand to support the, the female figure. He still needs to add the tail onto the female figure as well. And using a, a flame working process to do that. So that torch mixes uh, natural gas and oxygen and it'll get up around temperatures of 3,000 Fahrenheit. So John's gonna take a break for a couple of minutes here. Again, we need the temperatures to balance out. Uh, he needs to be able to hold the legs now in his hand so he can finish with the tail. But we can see from the discoloration down here that it's still really hot in that area. So we're gonna give him a, a couple of minutes, let the legs cool down, and then uh, he'll jump in and we'll, he'll be able to hold the female figure closer to the hand. He'll adjust the fingers so then the, the male will actually grip and support the, the female figure there. So this will take a couple minutes of cooling in the meantime. If you guys have any other questions, this is an excellent time for questions. Yes, sir. How does a certain area stay black? Like on the hooves, that's actually black glass. Yeah, so it is, it is glass that will start and stay black. Yeah. yeah. As opposed to the red, which fools you, and as you heat up just a small portion, that the portion that's warm but not quite molten gets black. There's a, a lot of subtleties to glass making. It's a, a big part of why we love to demonstrate this stuff here and, and give you the best explanations we can. There's, there's so much that can be easily missed with this material and a, a lot of subtle movements by, uh, by our artists as well. And all's quiet on the internet now too, huh? The, the web doesn't have any questions for us? I'm amazed the Torch Talk crew doesn't have more questions. All right. Yeah, so we'll give John just a, a few minutes, let those legs cool down. They're, they're getting there. We can tell just by looking at them how that temperature's doing. Excellent question. Uh, so 
Somebody wondering, as I've been talking about the way the, the color changes in the glass with temperature, is it difficult to design work because of these color changes? We just had that confusion between the, the red and the black glass. Yeah, there can be times where it does get difficult. Um, if John were to work, maybe say, uh, make a red bead and try to put black dots on it, while he's working, it, it may all look more or less black, but as he hits the glass with the flame, he'll see a little variation in the glow that will tell him where one glass is and where the other one is. So you, you sort of develop an eye to what the different colors look like at different temperatures. Uh, so for a bit, it can get confusing in design, but uh, for the most part, with experience, you can work it out. And you can also, as I mentioned, if you put the flame on a spot where you're confused, you'll generally see some difference in how the glass glows and how the, how the two different colors glow. So, good question. I like that one. And there are, there are times in glass working where we might make a, a design decision based on colored glasses and, and how they work together. Different colored glasses might have different viscosities than one another. Uh, at the same temperature, one might be really stiff while another might be really soft. And oftentimes, we have to take that into consideration. You might not want to build a certain pattern a certain way because one glass is going to be really soft and blow out a lot, while a stiffer glass might not blow out very much. So you might have a really hard time making a, a uniform vessel if you're trying to uh, combine certain colors for certain patterns. Uh, sculpturally, with solid sculpture, it's a little less of an issue because you're dealing with more thickness uh, and you're typically not stretching multiple colored glasses all at the same time. But uh, yeah, there, there often are times that we need to take our, our color considerations into account and, and maybe make some design adjustments because certain colors uh, just won't flow at, at the same rate with one another. So it's very hard to control the pattern or, or control the final form. So yes, we do certainly consider viscosities and, and differences in colored glasses. So there was a, a question from the web wondering about John's influences as an artist. And uh, I, I know just from looking at a lot of his work that he is heavily influenced by Geiger, the, the painter-sculptor, who uh, uh, most Americans are going to know his work from the Alien movies. And he, he, uh, that was his design of the Alien. And you, you'll see that as a recurring theme in some of John's work. And uh, I know his father has been an influence in his glass working. His, his father, Gunter Knie, uh, also a very famous glass worker. Uh, and some, some other glass blowers who have been an influence in his work. Yeah, and, and John, he's heavily influenced by uh, many different forms of art, different media, and uh, also heavily influenced by mythology. So some of you folks just walked in here. You're probably wondering why I'm sort of talking to nobody here. Uh, we, have, we are sort of in the midst of a demonstration. We have a, a visiting artist with us, and we're waiting for one piece of glass to cool a little bit so he can handle it in his bare hand and continue finishing this uh, pair of devils that are being sculpted over here. So uh, John Zinner is our, our guest artist. He's visiting us from Germany. And he specializes in this type of figurative sculptural work on the torch. So he's got a, a, a flame working torch on the, the bench there. He'll get started in a, another couple of minutes here. And typically in this space, we do furnace style glass blowing. So you see us using these, these big ovens, big furnaces, making bowls, vases, pitchers, goblets, things to that effect. Uh, but today we have a special guest artist and we are focusing our attention on John Zinner and uh, his sculptural flame working. So 
We'll, we'll get cranking in uh, just another minute with that. And uh, we are live streaming the demo too, so I've been sort of talking to our audience on the internet, not just talking to myself for the heck of it. <laughs> question from the web about burns when blowing glass. Uh, so does molten glass stick to you, I think was part of the question. Actually, molten glass does not stick to you the same way that metals do. Uh, really hot metal, your skin will stick to it and it's extra unpleasant. Uh, glass fortunately will not stick to skin that easily, so we don't, don't have to worry quite so much about that. But uh, certainly there is plenty of risk of burns in flame working. Uh, I know when I first get burnt, uh, if I happen to zap myself with the flame or a piece of hot glass, I try to get it under cold water as soon as I can, as immediately. Uh, however many seconds you wait before getting it under cold water can make a big difference to the the, the final blister and the, the final injury. And if you're a production glass worker, you don't have time to be put out of work by, by a blister. So those seconds make a huge difference. So that's, uh, that's my first suggestion. Beyond that, we'll leave it up to the medical community. So I'm curious to see what happens at this point. Uh, I've seen John work a little bit. Uh, I have not seen how he structurally connects two figures into one piece. Uh, my suspicion is that he's going to sort of lay the female figure in that open hand of the male figure, get a sense for how far he can close the fingers to get a, a good grip on her, and he'll sort of measure her in there, pull her out, heat, move a finger, and uh, continue to work his way along, I believe. He could surprise me, though. So starting to get some mass built up, building up some massive material. And the, the next move here is going to be to add on to the tail of our, our female devil figure here. Now, when John was working uh, the very beginning of the figure, he starts from the hip area and the, the butt area and the core. As he made the butt, he also started a little bit of a tail section, maybe a, a a fifth of what that final tail length will be. That allows him to heat just the tip of the beginnings of the tail. It, it's safe to heat that narrow spot a couple inches away from the core of the body of the figure. If he tries to heat right into the core of the figure and add the whole tail now, with the, the figure being cold, he's going to crack the core of the figure. So he's set up an area further from the core that he can safely heat into. 
and now he's got to attach that ball just onto the very tip of the tail and get it to stretch out uniformly. So it's a, a pretty, pretty tricky maneuver, and he's got to work in this order of process. Uh, otherwise, the, the piece just won't survive. Uh, it will crack. So he's sort of devised an order of process that works for this particular glass for the, the types of objects that he likes to make. So he's also sort of figured out how large a, a ball of material he needs to stretch out the length of tail that he's after. Now, as you heat glass, the atoms try to pull closer together. And uh, they want to pull into a sphere. So if he heats and turns the glass uniformly at a level horizontal, it will turn into a sphere. To build up a bigger sphere, you might notice he heats a little bit behind the sphere onto the rod itself. So that starts to soften up more of the rod material and it gets incorporated into the ball. So while well, it doesn't seem like he's doing too much here, there, there's a lot going on. He's, he's setting up a uniform heat, he's building up the size of that ball, getting it all set up, so now we can start to heat into the very tip of that stub of a tail. So he's already thought about how he can get hot glass back into this sculpture without cracking it. So it eases just the very tip of the tail into the flame. And you'll notice from the sort of the uh, discoloration of the glass, it, it starts to get livery and then sort of black where it's hot. Watch where it's sort of blackish on the tail part that's closer to the body. He's not going to let that blackish area get very close to, uh, to the butt. Uh, if he does, again, it's just going to explode. It takes very precise heating and movement of the glass. He, he's got a, a stub of a tail that is rigid, uh, just as rigid as these windows here. Just attached to the tip of that rigid section, he's got this big, thick mass of really molten, really soft glass. He's trying to get that big, thick mass to stretch out to the same diameter as that that really rigid stump of tail. Very difficult to do, to, to actually come out with a finished tail where you don't see evidence of how he made it. So it takes a, a really a lot of precision of temperature control and also really feeling out how the glass is moving, how it's stretching, where it's stretching from. For our borosilicate workers out there in the crowd, this will give you an idea just how soft this glass is. Hang out of the flame for a little bit, let it start to firm up. You still have plenty of uh, flexibility to get that big arcing curve. It's one of the beautiful things about softer glasses is they lend themselves very nicely to really flowing curves. Stiffer glasses make that a lot tougher. John has wisely positioned the tail so it will be out of the way where that male figure's hand is going to be gripping around the center of the body. You see he sort of pulled the tail down around her legs, so he's gotten that all the way out of that trouble zone. He's thought about the design, thought about what that next step needs to be. Even though he may not have drawn this specific design out, he knows in his head where this needs to go. He knows what the trouble spots are. He adds a, a lot of detail to the tip of the tail as well. 
has that sort of flowing flame look to it. I hope everybody at the Gallo out there in Laosha is doing well. Hopefully we have a, a big crowd watching their hometown boy, John, here. Live at the Corner Museum of Glass. It's a, a thrill to have him here. We had a, a question about heat retention in Laosha glass. Uh, somebody claiming that Laosha glasses tend to be stiffer than other soda limes that are similar. I'm not entirely sure that's the case, but I don't work a ton of soda lime glasses myself. Uh, but wondering if Laosha glass holds the heat better than some other soda lime glasses. A tough one to answer. They're, they're pretty similar. Um, my experience with Lausha versus Ephetre or Moretti glass, they're very similar. Uh, they, they hold heat very similarly. I don't think uh, a person with a, a ton of experience on one glass is going to see too much of a difference if they had to work the other. Building out the details on the, the tail here, getting that sort of flamey look built in. And you're sort of building out some, some width in that tail section by overlapping the glass onto itself, sort of lapping it back and building up a, another sort of vertical layer to then stretch out. Right. Uh, a lot of folks who are used to working borosilicate would build up a shape like that by building a ball, then squeezing the glass a little bit flatter, and then maybe stretching it out into shape. But uh, it is a little more common, I think, with soda lime glass to, to build up a form the way John is by sort of lapping it over itself. Soda lime just flows more easily into forms like this. My favorite things about flame working is how meditative it is. You guys sort of feel some of that probably. Nice and quiet in here and it's just sort of you and the, the hum of the torch. And you don't have to order a whole team of folks around. You don't need a whole bunch of assistance. You can just sort of be one with the glass and, and take your time with it. Gorgeous. How does it all fit together? So John is going to need to adjust the hand, the wrist, the fingers a bit. 
So at this point, you notice where he's heating. He's way in the back of the flame, not even really in the flame. He's sort of in the, the back burn of the flame. He wants to ease heat back in there. And again, with this red glass, he can watch the color of the glass. As he starts to see more of that livery black look come back into the glass, it's getting to a point where it's warm enough that he can then get more aggressive with the heat. So you can see the, the hand is darkened quite a bit. The wrist is darkened a lot. Now it's safe enough that he can start to be more aggressive with the, the temperature. Another question for the web, uh, if we need the air temperature to be in a certain range to be able to get away with work of this style, um, unless the air temperature were to change a couple hundred degrees, I don't think it's going to be an issue. And if the air temperature changes a couple hundred degrees, we've got much bigger issues. So yeah, uh, that shouldn't be much of an effect. Now breezes could be an issue. If there were a big breeze that were to blow through John's workspace, uh, it would blow the flame around to a point where it could hit a cold section of the sculpture and cause that to explode. Or if enough of a breeze blows across an area that's sort of in between temperatures, it's not really molten, it's certainly not down to room temperature, that could run us into some issues. But as far as ambient air temperature, it really would have to be a, a difference of a, a few hundred degrees. So I don't think we run that risk, thankfully. Yeah, just in case you couldn't tell, this is a pretty sensitive part of the operation here. Just trying to get that hand to fit the, the female figure in there just right. And She's pretty substantial. This better be gripped really well. It better be balanced well. Now, we don't want to actually put the cold female figure onto the hot hand. Otherwise, again, we'll run into a, a temperature issue and cause things to crack. But uh, I believe we are just about at that point. So uh, once this cools down, we will uh, put the female figure into the, the male hand there. But uh, at this point, how about a nice round of applause for our visiting artist, John Zinner. Fantastic. Thank you so much, John. Beautiful work.